So a bunch of new stuff has dropped regarding changes to the core classes and subclasses in the D&D 2024 handbook. Let's rank the new subclasses we've got and then talk about the new feats and some new spells which were revealed on YouTube and then taken down. Uh, but we'll get to that. First thing we got to talk about is the great old one, Warlock. I love me a tentacle-headed sugar mummy as much as the next guy, but the original great old one was kind of meh. This subclass was revealed by Sherlock Holmes, who also made some useful graphics, what a legend. All 1 D&D subclasses get their features starting at level 3 now, and the first great old one feature is Awakened Mind. Bonus action. Make a telepathic connection with a creature within 30 feet, and you can talk telepathically to them. There's no limit on how many times you can do this, but you can only do it with one creature at a time, letting you essentially act as a relay between all members of your party telepathically. You can enter the thoughts of any creature within 30 feet, not just an ally, so you can telepathically call the bad guy a prick while fighting them. It's a good roleplay feature. You also get these spells, pretty similar in vibes to the original, but I do like these ones better. Finally, at level 3, you get psychic spells. Any warlock spell you cast that deals damage, you can change that damage to psychic, which is pretty good. Psychic is an uncommon common damage resistance in D&D. Also, when you cast a Warlock spell that is enchantment or illusion, you can do so without verbal or material components. Undetectable sleep, hold person, charm person, silent image, minor illusion, all of these are great. This is a brand new feature and it's really cool. At level 6 you get Clairvoyant Combatant, and now when you form a telepathic bond with a creature, you can force them to make a wisdom saving throw. On a fail, they have disadvantage on all attacks against you, and you have advantage on all attacks against them for as long as you stay connected. This is solid, it doesn't require concentration, and it only uses a bonus action. You can do it once per short rest, unless you spend a spell slot to do it again. At 10th level, you get Eldritch Hex. You learn the spell Hex, good spell, and when you cast it, the target also has disadvantage on saving throws that use the ability score you choose. Fun fact, this is exactly how the Hex spell works in Spanish, due to a translation error. You're going to want a bonus action Hex, give disadvantage on wisdom saves and then have your wizard friend follow up with a dominate person or a polymorph or any instant win spell of your choice. You also gain resistance to psychic damage at level 10 and anytime a creature deals psychic damage to you they take that same amount of damage back. Finally you get create thrall at level 14. You can cast summon aberration without concentration and proceed to dominate the eldritch nation. From Sherlock's video where he breaks this down there appears to be no limit on this ability. He might have just missed it but if there really is no limit, this is crazy. We can't be sure until we actually see the book, but at a first glance, this looks really cool and pretty strong. A power upgrade to the original Great Old One Warlock while keeping a lot of the flavor. But are all these subclasses actually an upgrade? Let's take a look. And with that, you walk into the Pirate's Tavern. Cool. Um, what does it look like? Oh my god, he wants to know what it looks like? I didn't plan for this. Why do they have to always ask so many questions? I'm freaking out. Oh god, they know. They know I don't have any idea what I'm doing. I'm going to have to cancel the campaign unless... Wait, yes, of course. What does it look like? It looks like this. Bring your campaigns and fantasy worlds to life with stunning cinematics from Chepeku Scenes. Immerse players in the game with spectacular shots of your world. Each scene also matches perfectly with a corresponding Chepeku battle map, so you can use them as a pre-fight look at terrain or part of the narrative in story-driven sessions. And you can access the entire archive of Chepeku scenes on Patreon with every variation, including day and night, for just $5. The link to that is down below, with more beautiful scenes dropping every month. Take your game to the next level and grab every Che Peku scene in every variation for just five bucks on Che Peku scene's Patreon, link below. So the iconic rogue assassin subclass got dropped by my man Colby. And the OG assassin is iconic, but was admittedly very inconsistent. For the new one, at level 3 you get the usual proficiencies and a variant on the assassin feature. You have advantage on initiative rolls, nice, and you have advantage on attacks against any target that hasn't taken a turn yet this combat. That's the same as the old rogue. The change is with surprising strike. You no longer automatically crit against surprised enemies. 
enemies. Heartbreaking, I know. Instead, on the first round of combat, if you hit an enemy with your sneak attack, they take extra damage equal to your rogue level. Yes, it's less damage, yes, it's less cool, but it is more reliable. You no longer need surprise to do anything as an assassin. Level 9 gets you infiltration expertise. You can perfectly mimic someone's speech. It's a fun roleplay feature. Also, when you use a bonus action to take the steady aim feature, giving you advantage on your next attack, you can still move on that turn. So steady aim is improved for assassins. Level 13 is a totally new feature, Envenom Weapon. This is kind of interesting because it interacts directly with a new feature given to the rogue core class, Cunning Strikes. Basically, you can trade out some of your sneak attack damage when you hit a creature to instead give it a condition, like the Poisoned Condition. And Venom Weapon deals an extra 2d6 poison damage when you poison a creature with your Cunning Strikes. Is it good? Eh, it depends on how many monsters are immune to the Poison Condition and Poison Damage, because at the moment, it's a lot. Finally, at level 17, you get Death Strike. And this thing is kind of cracked. When you hit with your sneak attack on the first round of combat, the target makes a constitution saving throw, and if they fail, double damage. This isn't the same as getting a critical hit, which means it stacks with critical hits. If you score a critical hit on turn one with a short sword, you're dealing like 44 d6 damage. This seems like a pretty standard upgrade to the base assassin subclass. It's the same general ideas, but a little cleaner and a little more reliable. The surprise mechanics have also been changed in this new book, so the old assassin rogue probably wasn't going to work anyway. But that's a conversation for a different time. We will have to evaluate how backwards compatible this really is. We'll do that when we get access to the full book. For now, let's talk about the College of Dance Bard. This is the bard from the Unearthed Arcana that made monks literally die from jealousy. It was revealed by Ginny D. At level 3, you get dazzling footwork. You have advantage on performance checks made to dance. Makes sense. Your base AC also equals 10, plus charisma, plus dexterity, which is amazing. Your AC is going to be higher than pretty much any other bard right from level 1. You can also use dexterity dexterity in place of strength for your unarmed strike, attack, and damage rolls, just like the monk. Finally, whenever you expend a use of your bardic inspiration, be it as an action, a bonus action, or a reaction, you can make an unarmed strike. Basically, it's extra attacks on top of what you would be doing anyway. The damage of your unarmed strikes is also equal to your bardic inspiration die, so it starts at a d6 and climbs to a d12 by level 15. There is some discrepancy in Ginny's video about what she says this ability is and what she shows on screen, but I'm pretty sure what's on screen is correct. The damage you deal is equal to your bardic inspiration die. At level 6 you get inspiring movement, which lets you use a reaction and a bardic inspiration die to move up to half your movement speed without provoking opportunity attacks, and one ally within 30 feet can do the same. And also, thanks to your third level feature, you can make an attack when you do this. When you roll initiative, you can also spend a bardic inspiration die to give the result to the entire party's initiative role, which is great. Finally, at level 14, we see the time-honored D&D tradition of giving a random subclass a feature that the rogue got about 10 levels before. In this case, it's evasion. You take half damage from a failed dex save and no damage on a success. You can also share this benefit with allies within 5 feet of you. This is a fine subclass. I mean, Capoeira Bard just sounds cool, but it is definitely worse than its unearthed arcana version. Evasion for your capstone bard feature is kind of mid, in my opinion. The old one was better, it gave you irresistible dance for free, which was just peak flavor and actually really quite powerful. But let's talk about feats for a second. The first two were revealed by Pixel Circus. These are origin feats, so you get them for free at level 1. They are tied to your background. The first feat they talk about is Lucky, and it seems quite similar to the version of Lucky we know in the game right now. The other new feat is Alert. Here is the original. The new one gives you a bonus equal to your proficiency, so it's not a flat plus 5, and you can swap your initiative role with a willing ally if you want to. That's nice. It means you can pass your high initiative to whatever player is going to make the best use of it. Both of these feats are very similar to their original incarnations. A big part of working out whether this book is worth it for you is how much of this stuff is basically just reprinted. We can't know that right now, but these two feats at least aren't much different. There is a new feat though, Boon of the Night Spirit, revealed by Latinos against spooky shit. It is an epic feat, so you can only get this from level 19 or above. It gives you a plus one to dex, intelligence, charisma, or wisdom, and can increase that ability score up to 30 
More on that in a second. Then you can use a bonus action to become invisible while in dim light or darkness. There is no word on when this ends, so if it doesn't end when you attack or cast a spell, it's pretty good. Finally, you resist all damage except psychic and radiant while you are in dim light or darkness. It's pretty good, but the power to raise your stats to 30 is interesting. Epic feats seem intended to be given out when players reach level 20 instead of gaining more levels. So if you keep playing upon reaching level 20, you can get more and more of these feats and eventually raise every stat up to 30, basically becoming god. Finally, two spells were revealed by Good Time Society. Now, I know this video went out because I downloaded it, but it has since been taken down. Maybe WotC told them to pull it from circulation for some reason, I don't know. They do mention the Artificer in that video, and we know that isn't in the PHB 2024, so maybe that was it, but that is pure speculation. Either way, it's peculiar, but information on these spells also went out on Good Time Society's Instagram, so it is definitely meant to be available information. Everything we're talking about here is intended to be public knowledge. This isn't like a leak. The first spell they talk about is Cure Wounds. It now heals for 2d8, not 1d8. Simple balance patch, nice. The second spell is new. Tasha's Bubbling Cauldron. It's a sixth level conjuration spell and it summons a cauldron. The liquid in the cauldron is any potion of your choice that is common or uncommon rarity. As a bonus action, you or an ally can reach into the cauldron and withdraw a vial of the potion that you chose. You can take a number of these potions equal to your spellcasting modifier. So basically five. A sixth level spell slot to get five potions of greater healing is kind of eh? All unconsumed potions disappear when you cast this spell again. So it's not even like you can hoard a bunch of greater healing potions. You have to drink them. This is a spell that might go crazy if they release some really good potions at common or uncommon rarity. As it stands though, this seems like an okay spell to cast at the end of a day if you've still got your 6th level spell slot available. Everyone can grab a potion of greater healing for the next day and then you long rest and get the spell slot back. I'll do a breakdown on the changes to the core classes they've released alongside their subclasses next. In terms of what we've seen so far, the changes to the subclasses seem pretty good and significant, although it's worth remembering that they're probably going to share the ones that they are most excited by. My advice is to wait and until more material is out and you can see what is new and what is basically the same as before. They reckon there's about 400 spells in this book, that sounds good, but if 95% of them are just reprints, that might not bring any value to you at all. If you want to support this channel, you can do so on Patreon with the link down below. It makes all this possible and I release new races, subclasses, feats, adventures and tons more every single month. Also remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel, check out the content creators who revealed this stuff directly. Directly, and yeah, that's all I got. I'll see you next time.